so I'm happy to uh, give a talk on this topic, which is uh, very close to my heart, and all of it uh, would not be possible without the, the ever-growing list of collaborators who have worked with me on this over the years. Um, so I'm going to be trying to give a generic overview of tidal disruption theory. Um, there's many, many facets of tidal disruption theory, so it is difficult to cram these into a 25-minute uh, talk, so I'll skip a few things, and I hope some of the speakers after me will cover some of the other things I miss. Um, so uh, why do we uh, care about tidal disruption events around supermassive black holes? Uh, well, one, uh, one uh, reason for that uh, is that black holes aren't really doing as much as they are, uh, were at Z of 2 uh, at the present day. They're not really accreting very much gas. Many of them are just kind of sitting there, mostly dormant. Sagittarius A star is a prototypical example. It's accreting at a a uh, very small, small rate of 10 to the minus 7 or 8 solar masses per year. Uh, so most of these guys are invisible, and you can only really infer their presence from the dynamics on surrounding gas and stars, uh, but they're not actually bright and necessarily screaming out that they exist. So most things that study supermassive black holes are sort of long, uh, persistent phenomena, uh, things like uh, they're accreting at near the Eddington limit and they stay bright for hundreds or thousands of years. So they produce large scale megaparsec jets. Um, or they're actively engaging in a merger with another black hole, and you can see potentially transient episodes of gas accretion in those systems uh, on a more human time scale. Um, so there's uh, only a few kinds of events that can really give you short, very luminous, transient behavior around supermassive black holes. Uh, tidal disruptions of stars are a very promising candidate. Um, so every single black hole is surrounded by uh, a million or 10 million or 100 million stars. Uh, each of those stars is an extremely tiny chance of being disrupted by the black hole because the tidal radius is so much smaller than the size of the cluster. So the analogy I like is it's like throwing a grain of salt through the eye of a sewing needle two miles away. So it's very, very difficult to do this on a per star basis. The advantage you have, though, is that there's so many stars, you multiply that probability by a large number, it actually turns out to be not that rare, something like once per 10,000 years per galaxy. Uh, and they should happen around every single massive black hole. There's uh, some masses of black holes where they won't be able to disrupt main sequence stars because their short shield radii are quite large, but they can still disrupt giant stars. And even up to 10 to the 10 or 10 to the 11 solar masses, you can still disrupt giants. So I'll just give a very brief outline. I'll talk about hydro, then the observational signatures of the debris that's bound to the black hole after the encounter, and the debris that becomes unbound to the black hole after the encounter. So first, the hydro. So uh, this is just a set of slides I show in every single TDE talk, which just gives you the basic dynamics of how a TDE works. A tide is raised on the surface of the star. Mass is lost through the two Lagrange points. You have three components uh, of the star post-encounter, uh, which is a bound portion. This falls back onto the black hole. An unbound portion, which launches out at several thousand kilometers per second. And a surviving core, in some cases, where the disruption wasn't too severe to totally destroy the star. So I just want to point to one uh, interesting thing. We've been talking about massive black holes not being able to disrupt stars, and this has been argued for, say, Assassin 15LH, that perhaps it's not a tidal deception because the black hole mass is 10 to the 8. But uh, if you look at this expression here, this laser pointer doesn't work. If you look at this expression, um, there is a radius of the star parameter here in the tidal radius, which just scales linearly with the size of the star. Uh, the mass of the star figures into it at the minus one third power, and so this roughly scales as m to the positive one half power on the main sequence. So if you have something that's a several solar mass star, actually the tidal radius is a factor of a few times larger. And so you can actually disrupt those stars with more massive black holes. So that won't be as common as disrupting something like the sun, because those stars aren't as common, but it does happen from time to time. And we shouldn't just discount this out of hand that it never occurs. So this is just a movie showing the disruption of a star by a 1,000 solar mass black hole. The reason why we choose 1,000 uh, is because this is numerically a lot easier for us. 
Uh, it shows basically the salient features of the hydrodynamics material, flings out in this unbound tail, some of it returns back to the black hole, and it starts to form an eccentric accretion disk about the black hole. Um, so there was a bit of a misconception in the early days of tidal deceptions when trying to predict the rate that material will return to the black hole, where people assumed that you should take the binding energy spread at periaps and use that to calculate the time scale of return of material. Uh, it turns out that's not really the right thing to do, and this has been verified by simulations and via simple analytical arguments. Really, the appropriate place to freeze the binding energy distribution is when the star reaches periaps, and that's because the star loses all gravitational hold of itself once it crosses that location, and it doesn't matter exactly how deep it goes after that point. So really, the fallback curves that you get from tidal disruptions don't vary tremendously much on what this impact parameter is once you cross the tidal radius. And the nice result of this is that we can actually get uh, fallback rates and times that are pretty predictable. And they only depend on uh, three parameters, effectively, the mass of the black hole, the mass of the star, and the radius of the star. And there's a nice coincidence where, uh, again, these two sort of cancel each other out because the radius goes roughly as m to the 0.8 power. And you end up with a very nice flat sequence of peak time scales from stellar masses ranging from a tenth of a solar mass to 100 solar masses. So 1,000 in stellar mass gives you time scales that vary by maybe a factor of two. So that means that actually, uh, if you see a tidal disruption and you can measure the time of peak at the flare, in principle, it's possible to access the black hole mass without worrying too much about the other parameters. So uh, I should talk about some other interesting dynamics with the disruptions themselves. As I said, those simulations are at one to 1,000 because that's what we can do easily. But as you move uh, to higher mass ratios, the size of the star compared to the size of the tidal radius gets a lot smaller and the streams become extraordinarily thin. So on the left-hand side, you can visibly see what the streams look like. This is a collage in time. Uh, on the right-hand side, or I guess your, your left-hand side, uh, the streams are extraordinarily thin and barely visible on the slide. Uh, in fact, I've exaggerated their width there by a factor of a few so you can see them at all. And this is actually what they look like. They're hair-thin structures that are launched out away from the black hole and fall back onto the black hole. The reason for this is that while gravity in the star is uh, disrupted enough to prevent it from being a self-gravitating sphere, it's not actually disrupted enough to prevent it from being cylindrically supported by self-gravity. And that actually causes the stream to be restricted in diameter as it expands outwards. Uh, so this was something that was first uh, noted in a paper by Chris Kochanik in the 90s. We verified this with simulations, uh, and others have seen this in their simulations as well. So this is what happens. This is what they look like, these hyper-thin structures. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about the observational signatures of the bound debris. So this is the only observation that will appear on my talk, um, because I think Suvi will hopefully go over many of these um, in her talk. We've had some pretty nice optical uh, flares in the past five years or so uh, from various surveys. These are two examples from pan stars. Uh, they're great in the sense that we have the rise, the peak, and the decay. We have very good color information. We have spectral information that tells us a bit about the ionization state and composition of the gas. Um, and because we think, possibly, that we can relate the fallback rate to the light that we see, you can perform this exercise where you actually take the physical parameters of the disruption, mass of the black hole, mass of the star, various other things, and fit these light curves. And from that, you could actually extract distributions, posterior distributions, of what we expect the masses to be. So uh, we did this exercise for a couple of disruptions, and we measured black hole masses. and. We came up with numbers that seem fairly reasonable, maybe a bit lower than what you would expect from the M-sigma relation. And we kind of thought initially, ah, mission accomplished, that's great. Uh, we understand TDEs, they're a good tool. Uh, but when we thought about this a little bit more carefully, and this is pointed out by a number of authors, um, the material on the black hole, uh, when it falls back, does not accrete onto the black hole right away. And the majority of the energy is released right around the ISCO. So even though this looks very dramatic, there's lots of stuff being ejected and flying out and giving you a pretty movie, there's actually not that much energy here that's being released in this movie. You would get most of the energy by having it accrete right onto the black hole, and that's not happening right away. The reason for this is 
For pure hydrodynamics, you're actually dissipating only a tiny fraction of the total kinetic energy in the returning stream, the majority of which is going through its original Keplerian orbit like the star originally was, uh, per orbit. And for a million solar mass black hole, it's only 1% per orbit that you're dissipating. So if this was the only mechanism that operated, you would need 100 orbits of that debris before it fully circularized. So, this would be a problem because, as you saw in the previous slides, we're able to get pretty good matches relating the fallback rate to the light that we see in the TDEs. But uh, when you actually calculate the accretion rate from simulations, which don't invoke processes that enable faster circularization, there's this discrepancy where the fallback rates can be really high at first, but it, the accretion rates are much lower by orders of magnitude. So uh, in the Shiokawa plot, you can see uh, this discrepancy highlighted. It's about a factor of 20 in m dot, a similar amount in time. Uh, that's for a 1 to 1,000 ratio encounter. When you move to 1 to 1 million, that becomes 100 in both uh, quantities. So you would go from something that peaks on a time scale of maybe a month to something that peaks on a time scale of 10 years. So that would be not consistent with what we see observationally. So how can we actually solve that problem? Well, uh, black holes are test beds of relativity and they have strong relativistic effects. And in principle, uh, relativity can actually help you a lot here. What it does is it induces precession in the returning material. That causes the material to deviate from its original Keplori Keplerian orbit and collide with itself. Uh, that collision can occur very close to the black hole where it can liberate a lot of kinetic energy. So that can result in extremely rapid circularization. The problem is, is that the amount of relativity in the uh, dynamics of the encounter depend on the black hole mass. For low mass black holes, the relativistic effects are very mild and you can't solve this problem. High mass black holes, relativity gets really, really strong and you can actually have really strong um, self-intersections. So this is a movie from a Clement Bonnero uh, showing a precession just in the orbital plane uh, from the effects of GR. This movie looks quite a bit different from the one I was showing you before where you had stuff in an elliptical orbit uh, that didn't circularize terribly quickly. Here you can see that it circularizes pretty much instantaneously once it starts to strike itself. Um, and this is for a fairly reasonable combination of parameters, the sort of fiducial one solar mass with one million solar mass black hole. Uh, so Jane Dye has put together a fairly nice analytical paper where she calculates how much dissipation you'd expect to have uh, as a function of black hole mass and other parameters. Uh, and you can look at that paper if you want to get sort of more quantitative specifics. So, what this means is that TDEs that we see in nature may have sort of a dichotomous uh, behavior. We might see events where it's circularizing very effectively, the light follows the fallback rate quite closely, but we might have other events where things are slowed down by factors of tens or even hundreds. And the problem is, is that for transient surveys, they're not really tuned to be looking for things that are peaking on 10-year timescales. It's not really their business. And I think in a lot of cases, they're gonna mistake these things as being AGN that just happen to have have fairly weird accretion histories. So it's possible that these things exist in the data already, and it's just hard, I think, to pick them out from AGN activity, but they should be there. So we did a Monte Carlo, just sort of calculating the number we'd expect to be in these various regimes. Uh, on the low mass end, which is the top row, uh, you can see that most of the events fall into the slowed category. That's expected because the relativistic effects are not terribly strong. Uh, but as you move up to higher and higher black hole masses, 10 to the 7, 10 to the 8 solar masses, the majority of them are prompt, and that means that the streams are colliding very close to the black hole and liberating a lot of energy. So this is just a montage from that Monte Carlo showing you when the streams do collide after they've circularized around the black hole many times. You can see that many of them are just simply one and done. They go around the black hole once, they hit the stream in the first pass. Some of them, though, miss and give you this very uh, fantastic spiral structure uh, that can, in our calculations, loop around the black hole for a dozen times or so. Uh, so this is a movie from uh, Kimi Hayasaki uh, with Nick Stone and Avi uh, showing an example of hydro simulation where they have out-of-plane precession. 
Uh, and here you can see a case where the stream does get deflected out of its plane, it misses itself, and forms one of these uh, elliptical spiral structures. Now for numerical reasons, the ellipticity in the simulation is quite low. Uh, in reality, the ellipticity of the stars that are coming in is close to unity. So what you actually have is something where you look like you have a bunch of very high eccentricity Keplerian orbits at large scales, but a lot of precession and activity right next to the black hole. So you end up with these gigantic 1,000 AU scale, three-dimensional elliptical spiral structures. I think these are really kind of fantastic structures that you get around these guys, and they should happen. I mean, we think relativity, relativity is correct, and we think we're seeing tidal, uh, stars being tidally deceptive now. So these structures should be there, and I think that's pretty cool. So uh, there's another way to produce light, uh, and that's in the collision itself. Um, and in the collision itself, you can do two things. You can eject mass. Uh, that mass, as it flies outwards, can radiate light in a similar way to how a expanding supernova shell might. Um, and it can also just produce hot X-ray emission at the point of collision. The issue with this is that it may not work terribly well if you're in this regime where the stream misses itself. Um, this probably makes things quite a bit more complicated, um, but this is an important component, I think, uh, to consider, and uh, Steve Perron and Julian Kralik put out a paper suggesting this was an important mechanism, and I, I tend to actually agree that it should be considered amongst all the other means of producing light in the system. So uh, what's nice about all of this complication um, is that we had a problem in the TDE community where the observers are telling us actually TDEs are happening maybe once per 100,000 years per galaxy, not once per 10,000 years per galaxy. Uh, but when you do the two-body relaxation calculations to estimate the rates in nearby galaxies, you do find that 10 to the 4 number pops out, or 10 to the minus 4. And so there was a discrepancy here. We were predicting that there should be 10 times as many disruptions as there are. Um, and this actually explains it quite nicely. This just uh, suggests that a significant fraction of the flares don't look like the tidal deception flares that we're looking for observationally. They might be very difficult to detect. Okay. So in the last part of my talk, I'm going to talk about the observational signatures of the unbound debris. So roughly half the mass flies out away from the black hole and half of it comes towards the black hole. And uh, we were just interested, what happens to this stuff? Well, uh, the distribution of matter is a function of energy, in this case the unbound energy to the black hole is a mirror image of what falls onto the black hole. It's basically uh, exactly the same tidal forces experienced on the near side and the far side of the star during the disruption. What that means is that there is a uh, distribution of matter along the unbound stream as it travels outwards, and these different bits of the stream will slow down at different relative rates as they travel through the ISM. But then ends up doing to the streams as they travel outwards, the fastest moving low matter bits that are at the end of the stream will start to slow down first as they interact with the gas. The slower moving heavier bits will not slow down as much and you end up with these things that kind of look like shoelaces flying outwards from the black holes. So a naive calculation, if you just take the cross section of the stream and presume it travels like a train in a straight line, suggests that it actually these streams could get out maybe kiloparsecs before they stopped. Uh, actually, because these things kind of travel broadside, that they don't actually present the cross-sectional area, they present a sort of lateral area, a train traveling at some angle oblique to the flow. Um, they only travel something like a few tens of parsecs before they stall. When they stall, they dump a lot of energy into the ambient medium. Uh, the amount of kinetic energy carried by the disruption of a one solar mass star by a one million solar mass black hole is roughly one tenth that of a typical supernova. There's a really wide range of energies here because you can partially disrupt a star, only remove maybe a few thousandths of its own mass. That gives you a lot less kinetic energy. You could also disrupt a 100 solar mass star in principle and get the kinetic energy of that being ejected from the galactic center, and that can really be quite Quite large. Uh, beta also plays a little bit of a role in this. Um, it just sets the velocity of the most unbound debris. Um, and in kinetic energy terms, that actually does matter for setting the total energy. So this is just a movie realization of many of these things flying out from a galactic center and interacting with the ambient medium. The way that these, uh, the dynamics of these work is that they shoot out basically unimpeded by the ambient gas for a long time, not slowing down. But once they do start to encounter a gas mass comparable to their own mass, they slow down really quickly and they dump all of their energy in a fairly short amount of time. 
What it ends up doing is it produces supernova remnant-like things at the tips of these unbound streams as they travel outwards. So in this movie, I'm showing 10 to the minus 4 disruptions per year uh, in a model of our own galactic center. And it suggests, actually, that if you take a snapshot of the galactic center at any one time, you might expect to actually see a couple of these sitting there. So there is actually one supernova remnant sitting in the galactic center that's a pretty good candidate for this. And I'm not the first person to suggest that it actually uh, might be this mechanism producing uh, this remnant. Uh, it was first proposed by Kokolov and Malia in 1996. Uh, at the time, they thought this thing had a ton of energy. They thought it had 10 to the 53 ergs in this cavity. The logical reasoning for that is that they saw a lot of dust being carved out in the central um, nucleus of the galaxy that calculate the total binding energy of that dust, they said, aha, we need 10 to the 53 ergs to clear this out. Uh, then Chandra came online and actually measured the internal energy content of that remnant and found that it was something more like 10 to the 50 ergs of energy. Uh, so in the Kokolov and Malia paper, uh, they had this prediction that uh, the energy would be roughly 10 to the 53 ergs from this disruption. And the reason for that is that they basically put in this term here, this factor of 10 you can see kind of sneaking into the radius. Uh, that's basically the impact parameter. They presumed that the change in energy, the spread in energy across the star at periapse depended on the distance at periapse, not on when it crossed the tidal radius. So they made the same mistake that people made when calculating the fallback rates. So when you do that, you get a factor of 100 in the energy, which multiplies that by a factor of 100. And uh, that's basically where that discrepancy came from. So it's exactly the same reasoning. You freeze the energy right at, um, when it crosses the tidal radius, not at periapse. That's the correct thing to do. When you do that, you get the right energies. So this actually uh, has a lot of interesting things um, to it, little aspects. So as I mentioned, the energy Total energy in the X-ray uh, emitting gas in the galactic center is between 10 to the 49 or 10 to the 50 ergs. That's consistent with the energies that we're predicting now. The age of this remnant is very uncertain because an expansion velocity has not been measured for it yet. Um, the amount of time we've estimated for these remnants to last is on a similar order. Uh, the total amount of mass swept up in that uh, remnant is on the order of a few solar masses. So that's consistent with the idea of a half solar mass sweeping through maybe 10 times its own mass before stalling. The metallicity in that remnant is maybe a few times solar. So the argument was, well, maybe this is um, metal enriched gas from a type 2 supernova. It actually turns out that in the galactic center, the median metallicity of the stars there is maybe about three times solar. So it's not surprising to expect that the gas is enriched to a similar level. So I don't think I really provide strong evidence that that's a supernova and can be explained by simply pushing out the gas that's already there. There's also one last uh, feature called the cannonball. Uh, the cannonball was discovered uh, in the late 2000s. It's a radio and x-ray feature that uh, sits basically immediately outside of Sagittarius A East in this little knob. It has proper motion measured for it. Its motion suggests it's loosely coming from the center of Sagittarius A East, although it's a little bit dubious. Um, the proposal for what that was was a runaway neutron star. Uh, so that was sort of consistent with the picture of this being a type 2 supernova. But remember what the uh, dynamics of these streams look like. There's sort of this tip of this out outgoing shoelace that travels through the ISM. And you have to remember that in the galactic center, there are many dusty clumps of gas uh, that that thing can actually strike on its way out. And it's not clear exactly that the clumps will be able to stop the outgoing stream immediately. So a scenario that might be able to explain the existence of Sagittarius A East in the cannonball is actually something where the stream penetrates through a clump and continues on its way for some amount of time. So you can end up with a structure where you have a normal looking supernova remnant and then a radio and x-ray source resulting from the tip of the stream continuing to move through the ISM. So I'll just leave up uh, my final thoughts here. I think tidal disruptions really are very valuable scientifically, uh, despite the fact that their rates are something like, now we think one one thousandth out of the supernova rate, I feel like they're kind of more valuable per event than, say, a typical supernova, because you learn so much about supermassive black holes. So I'm really excited, actually, that the observers are finding a decent number of these now, and we get to play with the data. Uh, thank you very much. James, do you have any thoughts on jets? 
Yeah, so Ashley is giving a talk on jets, and so I didn't talk very much about them in mind, but what I can say is that the jet uh, event rate seems to be roughly one-tenth that of the optical or thermal flare rate. That suggests that there might be other uh, aspects going on that inhibit jet formation in many tidal disruption events. One thing could be whether the accretion rate actually exceeds the Eddington limit during the flare, for which a significant fraction may not. There's also a question of whether there's enough magnetic flux in the star to actually power the Blanford's Zaniac mechanism for the jet. Um, simulations by Oleg Sadowski have suggested it might be kind of difficult to get a dynamo uh, action going in an elliptical disk like you see in a TDE. So it's kind of unclear whether you actually have the conditions necessary to make a jet in many of these TDEs. Um, that being said, we have now two examples of them. So we need to be able to explain why they work some of the time. Uh, so I think that there must be conditions that are satisfied in some cases that are just not being satisfied in others. So it wasn't clear to me, sorry, uh, if you were arguing that the optical UV events that have been discovered in, in the last few years are coming from this prompt channel that you've been arguing or from stream-stream collisions. Right. So I think one way that you can distinguish the two is if you have a simultaneous X-ray and optical detection uh, from the flare. Uh, if that's the case, you know that there's material pretty close to the black hole that's presently accreting, and you also know that there's material fairly far away from the black hole that is either undergoing viscous accretion onto the black hole or is this stream-stream collision. Uh, in cases where you do not see the X-ray emission, there are ways out of it even when you have a disk present related to orientation. Um, a tidal disruption is sort of like a naked AGN. You don't have the dusty torus. You don't have necessarily a lot of gas surrounding it and blocking lines of sight that you normally wouldn't be able to see in a typical AGN. So in those cases, you can have situations where the X-ray emitting gas is just sitting inside this uh, circular rising structure and you don't see it directly. Uh, but Nathan Roth has some calculations suggesting that some of the X-rays can filter through, even in those cases where you're close to edge on. So I think that's partially the way we're going to be able to resolve this, is where, whether we see X-rays simultaneous or not. And also, I think the time evolution of the X-rays and the optical flares, like modeling those two together, I think will be able to distinguish that. So uh, you are talking about the, uh, when you are talking about jets, then you are talking about the radio uh, detected TD. But uh, in AGN, we see the same, uh, that only a, a small fraction of the, of the AGN are, are uh, radio, have radio jets, right? So it could be the same, that maybe, maybe there are jets, they are just not radio loud, right? Well, um, <clears throat> yes, that's a possibility, I suppose. I, I think there's been some estimates of the number of TDEs that should have detectable radio counterparts. It's pretty low. Um, I think Brian and Ito have a nice paper on this. Um, suggesting that even SKA might have difficulty finding these things. Uh, that being said, um, I do think they share so many similarities with AGN. I mean, they're around the same object of the accretion of gas. There has to be um, relationships between the physics in those two um, scenarios. Yeah, you showed this beautiful spiral structure from the, from the procession. I mentioned that would look very different from, from what we think we've seen so far, but I was wondering, at some point this, this will accrete, right? So then may, will it have lost its, its memory of, of all that procession and, and look like a regular uh, accretion event, or, or do you have some predictions there? Yeah, so I think uh, the simplest scenario would be that this is a very, very long road that all the material travels down, and they all travel down the same road, and when it starts to collide with itself, they will all go through that same collision point. So the argument in the uh, paper that we wrote discussing these delays suggested that perhaps you can preserve the fallback rate onto the black hole after this whole uh, elliptical structure forms, so long as it continues nicely once it collides at that point. I do think there's complications, though. The collision may not be very trivial in these cases. The streams can be offset from one another. They can deflect each other such that they do not collide at later times. They might actually lead to cyclical behavior, uh, which we, uh, I think I've seen maybe minor evidence of in some TDEs, but I would actually expect it to be really dramatic. You could see the accretion rate just suddenly shut off and turn back on in those scenarios. 